Hello, 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 everybody. I am Pedro. This and is I'm Meredith. Meredith. <laughs> we did a double on that one. That's all right. Not a big deal. We're just going to scrap the intro of the show. <laughs> yeah, This is Gritty Reboot. That's the worst intro we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> They can't all be winners. They can't all be winners. We stepped on each other's toes. We were both excited to start the show. Yeah. We were just we were just hyped to get into it. Sometimes I can't stop this woman from wanting to podcast. Yeah, I, I really actually very much enjoy it. Yeah, no, this is this is fun. This is fun. I hope it's fun for our five listeners. Yeah. Yeah, that's I really why do. we're here. Yeah. We're here for you. Yeah, we're here for you. And just because I love to hear myself talk. Those are the two reasons that this whole thing occurs. And I love you. Yes. <laughs> 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 the show is off to a bad start <laughs> yeah well we're doing something unconventional this week yeah yeah we are this week we are actually taking a look at a movie from my childhood very almost like before i could really start to comprehend movies we're taking a look at house party and its reboot mm-hmm. i have a very limited history with house party I was aware of House Party, but it came out in 1990, and I was a little too young at the time to want to watch like an R-rated comedy, so or an R-rated comedy like that, I guess, because I wouldn't have understood like kind of what was going on quite at that age. Yeah, you know, because I'd have been like probably when it came out, I'd have been six, so maybe seven when it got to video. You know, same age as Maya. You know, like can you imagine her checking out like an R-rated comedy today and no. getting any kind of value out of it? Yeah, so I just kind of missed it and, and and never really checked it out. It took me probably like another eight years, you know, probably like 99 or something like that, when I finally had an opportunity to sit down and watch the first three movies. And it was just sort of something that we did one day. And I think an edgy teen in 1999, that also probably wasn't the best headspace to watch House Party. So I, I didn't really care for it then. And luckily, I, I did care a lot more this time. What, 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 was, do you, what are your memories of House Party? I'm trying to think when I saw it, I was... I was young. I was probably a preteen, and uh, I just saw ca- caught it on TV, and uh, I didn't think much of it. I liked the one thing I did like was all the dancing. Yeah, yeah. You know, but other than that, that's my recollection of the movie. So it'd been years <sighs> since I'd seen it, and so this was a real interesting retrospective. Yeah, sometimes it's nice to catch up on it. Also, sometimes it's nice to see an older movie like this. That's a time capsule. Yeah. And that's a really nice thing you can sort of get exposed to. I think earlier in the week, we'd watched The Crush. And that movie is such a time capsule of like 1992, you know, very early 90s. And and this movie is a time capsule of late 80s, early 90s black culture, which I think is is really fascinating to take take a look at again. Yeah, it came out in 1990. So Yeah, so it would have been made in 89. And it has some of the best music, like. I just love this era. So I have one other thing to mention about House Party, and it's about House Party 2 before we get into it, is I think one of the reasons I was not interested in the series is I had the VHS tape, the valued VHS tape of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze, something I was a lot more akin to watching at the time. And in front of that movie, the only trailer was House Party 2. And it was such a terrible, lousy trailer that made that movie look lame. It's probably why I never, ever sought the movies out until somebody said, hey, let's shotgun all three of these. Yeah, I haven't seen the sequels. And yeah, so I, ha- I have seen the sequels. I mean, it's just diminishing returns. That's yeah, that's what I it. figured. It's, you know, it's the same sort of gag. It's, just, it doesn't, it's not quite as good in the second one. And the third one's just pretty lousy. I think, didn't we like go over the movie thumbnails of those movies? Yeah. And one of them looked really bad. Yeah, we watched like the trailer, I think, for part four. Yeah. Yeah, which is like a direct-to-video, straight-to... Yeah, I think probably I, I just straight-to-cable kind of move, exactly what it looks like, mid-aughts, straight-to-cable flick. And even for that, it, it didn't look very impressive. If my pops finds out I got in trouble... The golden school, age of hip-hop. Be Can't see, but I'm grooving. I'm a grooving. <laughs> Uh, there's a party tonight at Peter's house. Can I go? You're not going nowhere. Every little step you take will be around this bedroom tonight. Did you hear anything about a party tonight? Uh-uh. At least not any good ones. Hello, Tawatha. Do I feel like being bothered with Tawatha? Hello? Tawatha. Gotta love that name. So that's right. In 1990, A.J. Johnson, Tisha Campbell, 
Brian B. Fine George, Lucian Bowlegged Lou George, Paul Anthony George, Martin Lawrence, Christopher Play Martin, Robin Harris, and of course, Christopher Kid Reed. That's House Party 1990, and it's great cast. Yeah. The first thing I want to say about this movie right off the bat is this has like a weird feel of like an early indie comedy Mm -hmm. to some extent. And I really enjoyed that part of it is all movies are a labor of love to some extent. Some can be more corporate than others, but someone has to love a movie for it to get to the screen. And this movie had a lot more love into it and character. And you could instantly get that feeling from like the way it starts and, and the way it really carries itself. Yeah, it's almost like the movie had chemistry. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good way to put it. It's a film better than the sum of its parts. It's not particularly poorly directed or, or, or poorly scripted, to be honest. You know, I know we usually go down our, uh, our recap of the plot, and we're quite, kind of going to do that, but it, it's a really plotless kind of movie. Yeah, like just it's, it's a simple plot. Yeah, there's a party, there's some shenanigans, some bad things happen, they got sorted out. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. But I mean, a lot of comedies are super bad is just that. There's a little bit more to that. But there's... It's a still a pretty simple story. Super bad is very close to this movie. Yeah, yeah, that's a great kind of comparison to it. You know, it's an, it's sort of a nice, I, I guess, companion piece from the the Middows and, and you know White. Because that's that's all that movie is just like teenagers trying to get laid. Yeah, and and that's what I think this movie has a lot of charm with is like teenage shenanigans. Yeah, even though they're all older. <laughs> yeah, they they are. Yeah, they are in their twenties, and that's fine. In the nineties, it was okay to be like twenty five. And yeah, and, and, well, I'm a sophomore in high school, you know, and I can rent a car. So <laughs> this was all very, very difficult back then. Yeah, I'm not sure what grade they're supposed to be in in the movie. It's not really important. I always assume in a movie, everybody's a senior. Yeah, that's safe. To, that's a safe bet. Yeah, because I, I want to say I didn't. I didn't actually look it up, but they because this was so successful, there were other kid and play movies, and I know in like. 94, I think they play high schoolers again. And I remember thinking that at the time. I was like, aren't they a little a little ripe to be playing yeah. high schoolers? And that was, uh, they, they switched roles. Or, you know, Kid was the rich kid and play was the poor one. And they switched in the movie. I can't remember the name of it right now. And I feel bad that I don't. But I, that was the one I remember thinking, like, I was like, dude, play looks like he's 100. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it didn't really come together. But back back to this movie. <clears throat> yeah, we start with kid waking up for school. Then they she goes to school and there's a cafeteria scene where boys are talking about parties and girls. Yeah, and we're just sort of setting the vibe of this this movie's tone and its world, you know, where we're at. You yeah. Know, just we talked about earlier. They're starting to establish that chemistry. Um, obviously there's a lot of early nineties things that are, you know, cringy and, and you know, really laughable today. You know, a lot of the slang and stuff like that. But that's how it's always going to be in movies like this. And to me, I, I think it just adds to its charm. And that's from coming from somebody, once again, with, with no real nostalgia to it. But this does lead us into uh, a, a pretty goofy fight scene. Yeah, a kid gets bullied by these three bullies. And I believe the bullies are... Stab Pee Wee and Zilla? Yeah. Yeah, Stab Pee Wee and Zilla. Yeah. They, um... What, what do you think of these three? Um... <laughs> Bumbling idiots. Yeah, I think they do a great Three Stooges routine. Yeah. Like, it's almost a little too cartoonish at times, mm-hmm. but I don't think that really hurts the Especially tone. Especially the guy that talks like this. Yeah, yeah, like that's a little much, just a yeah. little bit. I can't stress it. Just they a try to line. do that in a remake, too. And they do, they guy. do. There's, a, there's an homage to it. There's an homage to it. It kind of works here. I, I think they deliver more laughs than groans, and that's, I think, a, a more than a more than worthy compliment to sort of give these three actors and the yeah. performance that they give is there's, there's a lot more moments where I was kind of like, <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, just a little <laughs> or wind exhaling from my nostrils as quickly as possible. I laughed quite a bit through this movie. I did. I, I, I was surprised how many times I, I actually really had a legitimate, yeah. laugh, not just like I kind of smiled or giggled. Cause you know, sometimes I watch a lot of comedy and I just kind of, <laughs> you know, like just a, a slight elation, but there were some legitimate laughs in the film. I think, there were some jokes that have really held up. And I, 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 well, I think one of the other things about it, like, first of all, the, the fight scene isn't one of those moments. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little cheesy. You know, this movie was filmed at Plays Real Home in LA. I did not know that. You should never film in your home. Yeah. Trust me, for a man who's worked on many crews, never film on you, in your home. If a film crew knocks on your house and said, hey, we would love to use your house to shoot in, you look at them and go, fuck off. You don't let them in, all right? 
You know, you do let them in, but for a price. No, man, they will they'll fuck shit up. I guarantee it. That's okay if they they pay for the house. Yeah, but that takes time. That takes time. If they pay me what it's worth and 10% more, we got ourselves a deal. What do you who are you? <laughs> what what is this? What 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 is this podcast become? <laughs> we're barely into the movie here. We're already <laughs> <laughs> this show's off the rails. <laughs> uh, Started with our intro. It, it really did. It, it really did. So he gets in a fight at school and he gets reprimanded. And the main reason that he is scared is because the school is going to either call his dad or write a letter, mm-hmm. which is so 90s, right? Like mm-hmm. he's waiting for the mail to come. Like he's trying to cut it off. Like that's a big deal or something like that. I used to do it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Like I... I was not a good student. I could give a fuck about school. Yeah. I just never was like that. It wasn't until I got to college where I was like, you know, I think I should make good grades. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. That's where you want to yeah. do it. That's where you want to do it. Yeah. That's what I've been doing. That's worked out pretty well. It was like a clap of thunder right here. We are recording during an all-out thunderstorm right now. That's how much we love you guys. Yeah. Well, we don't have a choice. Yeah, well, so we, we got to get the show done no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, we... We come back home and we meet Robin Harris, who's just pop. Mm-hmm. And now this is one of those things that's sort of tough to describe about an actor and a rough performance, but it's still being amazing. Mm-hmm. And that's really what this is. Like at times he's almost barely intelligible with some of the things that he says, but this man delivers some of the hardest belly laughs in the film and plays a surprisingly warm yet tough character. He cares about his son. I think that's the the revelation I had watching the movie as an adult. Because when I watched it back in 99, he's just an annoying parent parent character. Yeah, of course. And I I love that there's a scene where early on in the movie, before we even get to all the shenanigans, when he wakes up, he makes kid breakfast. A spread, too. Yeah, he gets him all this stuff. And then he goes to tell him something. And he's just passed out of the bed with his shoes on. He was just that exhausted. That was the last thing he had energy to do. Was to, to leave that for his son. To make his son breakfast. And I, I, it's a great character touch. It tells you a lot without having to say anything. Yeah. Which is the, one of the things I love in a movie. When I can see a scene, I'm like, okay, I already really get this. And that's the thing. Like, he cares about his son. You know, as he finds out about the fight, the first thing he does is do what any good dad should do. Like, you ain't going to no goddamn party. You stay in your ass at home and doing some studying. Right. That's You got in a fight too bad. You don't go. I, I think that works really well. I was surprised how well that worked, how much I identify with that character. That was very interesting. He's just a single dad just trying to make it work. Unfortunately, the mo- this movie was released before the death of Robin Harris. He died nine days after the release. Yeah, it, it's, it's a real tragedy. I, I grew up, I, I, well, I, didn't, I wouldn't say I love Bay Bay's Kids, the, the movie, but it was on HBO a lot. It was. Kids. Yeah, because it was a cheap kids movie. It probably cost them like a dollar to air that. Yeah. Because it was, it was a notorious bomb and it's awful. And it's an even worse Super Nintendo game. Maybe one day I'll stream it on the Twitch channel. But that was a movie based off his characters. He is not in it because he was dead when they made it. So it has someone else doing a sound alike. So I've always had Robin Harris, had a great fondness for him, even though I realized who I had fondness for was just the guy who was the voice in that movie. Not necessarily him, you know, isn't that kind of strange? Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of like if you hear JFK talk, like all you can think of is like all the impressions, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But JFK doesn't really sound like that. Occasionally he'll get like that Massachusetts accent in his voice. Yeah. That Boston accent. But for the most part, like he just sounds kind of normal, but you just remember the impressions Mm -hmm. and how much they played that up. And that was sort of interesting going back in. That's how I felt about watching him actually perform is I, I was realized like, oh, I, I haven't really seen this, even though I'm kind of familiar with it, which is strange, I guess. Yeah. But I, I, I do like everything that he does, you know, and trying to force him to stay home. I, I think yeah, it all works. I like, the, I like that character a lot, too. Yeah, he, uh, he gets grounded. He gets caught by his dad. He gets grounded just a little bit before his kid's about to slip out and go to the party. Um, but he slips out anyways. And then Play goes over to pick up um, Martin Lawrence's character, who plays the DJ in this movie. Yeah. And I can't think of the name of his character. Bilal? Bilal. Bilal. Yeah. Yeah. He's the DJ. I, I really love the, sh- <laughs> the like, the, sort of like a Tetris kind of joke. They're trying to get everything in the car. Yeah. Scratching the shit out of the amp. Because I love that, you know, having to move big, expensive equipment. Sometimes people are just like, yeah, just get in. They're like, no, that's thousands of dollars. Don't touch that. Yeah, I, I really like that. I thought that was pretty funny. 
And I like how he, he gets left behind. Well, Martin Lawrence is, he's pretty good. Yeah, he, he, he is still. He's pretty charismatic. Yeah, you can see the, where he's going to go in his career. Yeah. Some of that's here in this movie. He's good. He's very good. And he certainly helps a lot of the, a lot of the comedy get across. I didn't think the acting was too good in this movie. No. Some were better than others. Yeah. But that's a note of mine. Well, I think you know why kid's the lead. Yeah. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, plays fine, and that's it. He's just fine. You mm-hmm. know, there's a lot of times he kind of, he just, he kind of has the only one way he can come at you. That's mm-hmm. it. He only has one kind of delivery. He would get better as, you know, he made more movies. You know, and th- these guys got to make a few more because this was a big hit, a big hit. But. You know, in this one, he, he's a little limited, so that's why they give Kid, I think, the, the more interesting and challenging role. Yeah. And I think he does a, actually a pretty nice job, if, in all honesty, for a guy who's a non-actor. It's just kind of a thing that's, it's a weird Hollywood tradition, like, hey, you're a rapper. You could probably act. Get in there. <laughs> like, it's just something Hollywood movies do a lot. And I, I think Kid does swim. Play does, does all right. Play does all right. And then uh, we we got to meet a couple of girls in the cafeteria at the very beginning of the movie. These girls show back up and they start gossiping about kid and play. So we have um, Tisha Campbell here mm-hmm. playing uh, Sydney, and she's from. She'll be with uh, Martin Lawrence again in his show Martin for a number of years. Um, did you ever watch? You ever watch Martin? No. You didn't watch Martin? No. I figures you. I'm white. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know if you just caught it. You know because. You know, as I have white parents, it's, it's, it's very, it's very true. No, we, we watched, we watched Martin and I've, I've caught it all throughout the reruns and stuff like that. So I'm fairly familiar with it. one of those sitcoms that I have a fond memory of, but I haven't seen it in like probably like 20 years. Yeah. It was maybe the last time I saw an episode when it was just on TV because it was at least dependable entertainment I could find on BET or something like that. So kid is out walking. He's trying to get to the. So he, he sneaks he, out. Yeah, he sneaks yeah, out. Yeah, he sneaks out. Party. They have the great shot of him going out of the house and sneaking out the door. And like the second he shuts the door, Pop's eyes like are <laughs> jolt open. I love that. Every dad just kind of knows. But yeah, he is walking down the street and we get introduced to really, what are really the only white characters in the movie. Yeah. Uh, the cops. And all they do is they just hassle characters early on. They, the cops kind of bounce in and out of this movie as sort of the antagonist. Besides the bullies. I mean, the bullies are the antagonists, but also the, the cops are, I guess the cops are the real antagonists, if you think about it. Yeah, the cops stop kid as he's walking to the party. And they give him a lot of grief. Yeah, they do. They do. I always find it interesting that, like I so said, this movie was made in 1990, a very yeah, long time ago. Yeah, we still have that problem. Yeah, it's, it's still a very typical thing that we deal with police. And the, that situation's only gotten worse. It's just a, a part of our culture for a very, very long time. You were just talking about Fresh Prince, and I, I remember... When Black Lives Matter first started getting off the ground, people started referencing an episode of that show from all the way in like 92, a little bit after this, talking about, you know, how police just shoot black men. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just sort of a given. And, you know, in this movie, you know, this is a black perspective and a black voice. So I, I do like that these, you know, these ribs, these jokes in this movie about this. And, and you sort of, I guess you lament that a situation could have gotten better over time, but it, it really only has gotten worse. Yeah. Which is, I, I guess... Sort of the weird thing of the like watching as a future viewer, <laughs> and then you know, in these days, you, you look at that and it's kind of a sad thing, but it is interesting the way they do play it for comedy. And what I think most of it works, most of it, and they're white cops, yeah, 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 like what we've been seeing in the news, yeah, yeah. And like I said, the the, the white characters are, are coded as probably the worst characters, except the for the few minor, the few cases where we had black guys actually like being the perpetrators, black yeah. cops, yeah, it's it, it, the, the blue. The blue is the problem. Yeah. That's the most political thing I said in the show. Fuck the police. So. <laughs> okay. So we have that whole scene and then they run into the, he runs into the bullies. Yeah. He ends up at an old folks party. He does, how would you call it an, an old folks party? You make it sound like you walked into a nursing home. <laughs> I was like, Hey, oh, and it's like a walker comes out. Well, <laughs> they're older. <laughs> they are. They, yes. They, he brought into what I'd say an adult party. Yeah. Well, no, that makes it sound like it's seedy. An adult party. No, but it's um, sort of like a ball, a gala, maybe. No, it's not a gala. It's a ball. No, it's not a ball. It's not a ball. What is it? What the hell is this thing? It's a soiree. A soiree. Are you sure it's not a box social? No. <laughs> so the kid crashes the soiree along with the bullies, and they end up making a, a musical number out of it, which this, by the way, this is a musical. Yeah. Weirdly enough, it kind of is. So, and I think the numbers are all pretty well done. I mm-hmm. think this is good, harmless fun. It's a little cheesy, but like I said, harmless fun. I generally had a smile on my face throughout this number. 
And this ends once again with the white cops uh, arresting them. And luckily, nobody at the party, because they had a good time, nobody wants to press charge. Yeah, the bully tries to strangle Kid. He does, yeah. Then Kid kicks him in the balls. But meanwhile, we go back to the party, and it's hopping. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a fantastic house, house party. Now, also, I want to say this house party is just at the edge of believability, right? Yeah. It's just a little bit better than a real house party All could be. All movie parties are like this. Yeah, but this one, like some movie parties, like you go into a house and they have all this fancy decoration and lighting. Like, ain't no way I'm fucking set that up. Because there's a gag at one point when it's like, where's all the snacks? He's like, man, feed your damn self. You know, because <laughs> that's what a house party is like. There's no food. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you bring your own, you know. Whoever was unfortunate enough to actually throw it gets their entire house ransacked for whatever <laughs> people can find. You know, that that's all a house party is. So it kind of has that feeling, which I, I really like. You know, it actually is a house party. Yeah. So we, we got that going on. We got the party kicking up. <laughs> we got the party kicking up. <laughs> Don't you know? And then Kid finally arrives. And then we have the neighbor, Walter. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, man, who's this actor? Yeah, he's in everything. Yeah, he's in everything. He, he basically gets a monologue <laughs> where he just gets to bitch at the, the kids for having a party and a good time and bitch at his wife while his wife's just telling him to chill out. I now I can't remember who the hell this guy is, because he's he's in Friday as the dad. Yeah, he's in Friday as the dad. I know? love Friday. Yeah, those that's a yeah I love Friday a lot. This is I like Friday after next too. I'm not really familiar with the sequels. Oh really? Yeah, I'm not really familiar with the sequels. Oh damn. Yeah, once I saw, we we'll che- have to watch those. Yeah, no, I, we can, we can. There's not a reboot of Friday, but I, I'd be more than down with doing like a series retrospective. That's also what we're doing with Texas Chainsaw coming up soon. Mm-hmm. It's just every other movie's a reboot now. So this movie truly is a musical. Mm-hmm. It has musical numbers, and they're singing while they're doing it. Yeah. So this is technically... And yeah, no one perceives that as strange or weird. No. And that's that's okay. There's a lot of other movies made with rappers of the time that would have these kind of musical interludes, so that's not uh, that's not atypical. Kid gets arrested. Yeah, there is a... He had that little fight, and he gets trapped in a yeah. fridge. Yeah. Which is deadly, by the way. But he's trapped there by the, the bullies, and of course the cops come in, and the cops, um, you know, they muck everything up, and they, they throw him in jail. And this is, you know, when, when the house party has, has come to, it was come to an end for kid. You know, he gets stuck in jail. We have a really nice, I think it's a good sequence, but it is playing, you know, prison rape for joke, for laughs, basically, yeah. which is something that's a little taboo today, something you don't necessarily want to do. But th- this movie is good natured. There's, you know, I mean, obviously it's still a rape joke, so they can't be that good natured. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, 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 I was trying to think, I can think of a few good natured rape jokes. But, this movie, I guess, is kind of one of them. You know, this is just a kind of a lighthearted musical number about something in 1990 that was a, a perfectly acceptable thing to joke about in public. You know, you could make a joke about dropping the soap, and that was perfectly acceptable, perfectly fine. You know, and that's really the only joke the movie has. They don't, you know, you know, they talk, I guess they go a little bit into it in the rap, but, you know, that, that's all it is. I, I, I still think it is, like I said, dated and cringy, but it's in a good-natured sort of way. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about it? No, I I thought the movie was pretty good. Mm. You know, I didn't love it. Yeah. But uh, it had a lot of good moments. I, like I said, I liked all the dancing. And I liked the fact that it was a musical in a way. Cause yeah, the, and it, and, but I do, do love that music. It's like my favorite genre. It certainly is something I know appeals to you. And it certainly appeals to me a lot more now than it would have any other time I've watched it. So, you know, my head was bobbing throughout the whole movie. But another thing that I like is the, the whole finale of the film is Kids in Jail and to save his his poor butthole, all of his friends get together to get him out of jail. Everybody gathers up, mm-hmm. and I, I like that. It's a story about friendship at the end of the day. And I, I'm glad that this movie has, like, even a, even if it's small, a journey for those characters to make. Yeah, you know, because they had their issues and they came together when it really mattered. And you know, how everybody gets together is good fun. You know, I I, I love everything about how all of that plays out. It's really. I think it left me with a smile on my face. And like I said, there were a few good jokes here and there. Yeah. And, you know, I just need a little bit of something in a movie to grasp onto, to feel, you know, you know, and there was a, there was some decent character work here. Even if there wasn't good acting, there was always some funny jokes. Even if they were dated, there were still a lot of things that I laughed at. You know, this is a solid recommend. You know, I, even if it's dated, this is a good comedy. There's no other way to cut it. 
you know, even if you may not be into the subject matter, you don't know anything about early nineties, uh, black culture or anything or dance like battles. that or dance battles or, or rap music. I, I still think you could enjoy this. If you were an Amish person and you just started watching movies, you would probably enjoy house party. Yeah. It's a really well done film. You know, it doesn't get a lot of praise because it's a comedy. Kid and play have a lot of great chemistry. Yeah. Once again, you know, you, you don't need great acting necessarily to make for a good film. You know, the Everybody chemistry seems the, to have good chemistry. Yeah, the thing. chemistry and the charisma really shines through. To, you can I tell that they a, a solid flick. You can tell that they spent some good time together. And yeah, yeah. Enjoyed each other's company. Yeah, this was a film, like I said, made with love. You get that kind of vibe, and and being probably a bit of a smaller production, you know, everybody was probably a lot closer and tight knit. I'm, I'm sure they probably had some fun. I'm sure it was rough, but I'm sure there was some fun days on the on this set. Is there anything else that you want to say about this movie? I like the ass whooping scene at the end. Yeah, that 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 made that made me laugh because that would that's also the true character journey. Pop has been looking for his son all night. He's been hassled by the police. Yeah, yeah. But I love the way he handles the cops. Like, mm-hmm. like fuck off. Like he could give a shit about those cops, and I, I really like that. But he he comes home and he just whips the son. And yes, it is child abuse played for for laughs, but. It's kind of like one of those things like everybody whooped their kids. Yeah. That, I that got paddled. Yeah. That's how it is. Yeah. He fought in school. He was told to stay home. Yeah. He was grounded and he snuck out at night. Yeah. That's a paddling. My grandmother made me pick, pick my own switch. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It's just, it's just how it was, especially in that day and age. Like, yeah, you were going to get an ass whooping for that. Cause that was, that was the only other way you, <laughs> you would get to understand that you did something that wrong. Yeah. So. And I, oddly enough, like I said, as a time capsule, I thought it was a great way to end the movie. And so it is a fun journey for him. And it's, you know, it makes me laugh. Archie Bunker can make me laugh. Doesn't mean I agree with his politics. Right. You know, let's <laughs> say the same thing. So once again, a really got solid recommend to this movie. All right. I have a couple of facts here. During the party at Play's house, all the dance sequences are done with no music. A.J. Johnson choreographed her and Tisha Campbell's routine for the battle. The toe touch and kick were signature moves of Kid and Play, which is also played in the, in the, the new... Yeah, in the reboot, in the they reboot. referenced that. So they did their own choreography, what you're telling me? Yeah. That is amazing to me. Full Force, a hip-hop group from Brooklyn, pay, played the bullies in the movie. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's who that was. Interesting, okay. Some of the cast's real age was much older than, than the high school students, obviously. No shit, yeah. <laughs> Martin Lawrence was 25, Kid was 26, Play was 28, Robin Harris was only 36. 10 years older than Kid was, who played his son. <laughs> okay, that's a little wild to think about, but all right. And then last one, in 2022, this movie was selected for preservation in the National Film Registry at the Library of Congress, deeming it culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. Yeah, it is, uh, it's a classic. Yeah. It, it should be there. But it, the movie was a, a really big hit. Like I said, we got a franchise of them. Uh, two movies, I think, went to theaters, and then one... Either straight to video or j- just a, a TV TV movie, but obviously that led to, of course, the inevitable reboot. So uh, this very year, 2023, we got Kid Cudi, Melvin Gregg, Andrew Santino, DC Young Fly, Karen Obalorn, Tucson Cole, and Jacob Lattimore in House Party 2003. Come on, get your lazy ass up. All right, take two. All right, I'm already. That's what you get, staying out partying all night. I'm a promoter. I'm working. I got like 18,000 followers. You know who got followers? Jesus. Take your rude ass to work. You just cursed. What would Jesus say? Jesus would say, shut the fuck up. This is my house. Red band trailer. See you late as usual. You need to clean this place. I ain't got all day. So our characters are a little older here at House Party 23. Yeah, they play... It's no longer a teenage story. Guys. Yeah, it's no longer a teenage story. They are just... Just guys, young guys, yeah, young guys, <laughs> doing young guy thing, going out, <laughs> lifting weights, frolicking together, frolicking. That's what men do. They frolic. <laughs> I'm going to call my friends and go, let us go frolic together in the fields. You don't do that. Yeah. We do it with our shirts off. That's not weird, is it? No. Great. After the frolicking, we watched House Party 23. Yeah. So, first off, I, I want to say this as we get into the movie. I read a lot of reviews coming into this because I was curious. You know, it looked like a bigger production, and the reviews weren't good, to be perfectly frank. They, they weren't great. Uh, uh, one of the, um, I guess, a friend of the show, uh, Tudor Reviews, I did some work on uh, his show, and I 
edited his house party episode and he was not thrilled about this movie that much at all. And I want to say it was better than I expected. Yeah. I think low expectations really help with that, but I had a few chuckle worthy moments in this movie and there were a few character beats that I did enjoy. I found this to be acceptable. This is like the, the lowest recommend I could give. But it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Yeah. Um, it's a real zany trip. Yeah, yeah. There, there's some really laugh out loud. Mo- Kid Cudi is just a laugh riot in this one. And that's not something I thought I was going to say. But every well, scene with him zaniest. is fantastic. I know we're just kind of jumping around all on this one. But like, I just want to mention that like he, he really does lead to a lot of laughs. Because you know, early on... We, we get, I think the film starts out nicely enough as we get introduced to our characters mm-hmm. and our situation, everything like that. We get the bullies. Yeah, we, we get very similar characters. So this time they're trying to shut Damon down for a... Uh, Damon. Damon, not Damon. Damon. Uh, yeah, he makes a point of saying that. Damon. They are like what, what, rival like club promoters. Damon is. Yeah, and that's what they, the bullies push him out of that. Basically, the, the place he was going to be able to throw a party and everything like that. So he's shit out of luck. Mm-hmm. Which is what sets up the entire film. Because... As their cleaners. And by the way, they're awful cleaners. I did like that joke. They're like, who do you guys are? Idiots? We have you on camera. And they cut to a bunch of shots. And them smoking d- weed. Yeah, Demol and Kevin just smoking weed and dicking around. <laughs> like, just <laughs> fucking shit up for no reason. <laughs> just general mayhem. So they get their asses fired. When they, and then, of course, as they continue to clean, we get the kicker of the film, which is... It's LeBron James' house. Yeah. It's LeBron James. You, you could just shout him out if you know. Okay. <laughs> I, I asked Meredith that. I, just, I looked over at you like a deer in headlights. Like, do I do I say something? <laughs> you always can. The microphone, it's live. The one in front of you. you Whatever, dude. <laughs> so it's LeBron James' house. Okay. I like these LeBron jokes that come straight up. Yeah. About, with the mirror. Yeah. I, yeah. With him talking about you handled everything with the decision perfectly. Which to me is a good thing that LeBron could look at that and sort of chuckle. At least that's positive. But, and about his hair. Yeah, he does chuckle about his hair, which is he, he seemed like he was sensitive about. There's a better joke later on when he's when they're calling all the celebrities, and they're going down the list, and he's trying, calling Dr. Dre, and it's like, oh, this is Dr. Andrew. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 I don't need any hair transplants. I thought that was a, a great joke. He accidentally called LeBron's hair doctor, but that yeah, I, I did appreciate those jokes at LeBron's expense. Yeah. So I was I was like, when somebody could poke fun at themselves. Yeah, because. If nobody knew this, this was made by LeBron James's production house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This was a good idea to try to reboot House Party. Yeah, it it had a little bit more substance. Yeah, I, I think this was a solid idea. Like there's some movies like, you know, you see a reboot coming up like I don't know about that, but I think the idea of like a House Party a House Party movie is always a good idea. I think the biggest mistake is to not have it be a story about teenagers. That was probably the thing I would my my biggest critique on this movie. I think Damon has like some balls because it's his idea to have the party at LeBron's house. Mm -hmm. And it's his idea to call all the people on his list to come to the party. Yeah. Yeah. There's a nice scene of him calling and reaching out to celebrities. And of course he does reach out to Maya. Yeah. 90 songs for herself. Yeah. I'll splice in a little music here, but yeah, he does send her a, a tenderly worded email. Because she's from the 90s. So and he loves her. Yeah. I love that whole joke because I, I'm, a, I'm also a big Maya fan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's great when she does show up in the movie because you almost forget about it when mm-hmm. she just kind of walks in. Because you have the movie's other reoccurring character who's not as pretty as Maya. And that's the koala. Yeah. This fucking koala. You get... The way it's written is fine. It's actually pretty good because they just talk about the koala. You see it like run by... But you don't see it clearly, right? Mm-hmm. And so they build up the mystique of the koala. You know, there's you know a whole sort of bit about it. Yeah, because the neighbor has a pet koala. Yeah, the, the neighbor who comes by, he's the whitest man on earth, right? Yeah. And he's, I was going to talk about this, the history of like the, the lame white person in a black movie, right? Yeah. This is one of my favorite tropes in, in, um, in cinema. Any element of black cinema you'll find is there's always either a, a really, really lame white guy in there. Who just wants to be with the hip black guys? Mm-hmm. And this movie does the this, the movie does the joke pretty well, in all honesty. It's not my favorite interpretation of it, but I did sort of chuckle at this guy's performance. And also, I would really want to meet LeBron James too if he was my neighbor. And I'm pretty sure if I was LeBron, I would do everything in my power to avoid that man. Yeah, <laughs> I bet he does. Yeah, yeah. So I, I did like that. I did like that. But he has this koala, 
And it's not till like midway through the movie that we see the koala as it attacks the bullies, right? And it saves Damon. Mm-hmm. And it's great because it is like the world's cheapest like puppet. And I mean, like it's like almost like a puppet you put your hand in. Yeah, it's like the quality of this thing. And it's a you, when you see it, you can't help but laugh. And then my favorite bit is Damon tries to like, wow, I I underestimated you. I'm sorry, I made fun of you. You you really came in and saved me, and it immediately mauls him. <laughs> <laughs> and that, like I said, there are a few really nice gags in this movie, and I, I thought that was. One of them. I appreciated the charm of how cheap the goddamn koala bear looked. I, I really did. And you see it smoking weed later. So, I mean, like, it, it is. <laughs> they really get a lot of mileage out of that cheap ass koala bear costume. Well, or koala bear with pop. some of the, the better jokes come some of the lamer jokes. Yeah, yeah. This movie also balances everything out with some pretty bad jokes. Um, I mean, there's a long stretch in the first act where there's nothing funny happening. They're just sort of setting up the plot. So I think you talked about like some of the lamer elements of the movie. And I thought something that was really lame is in one of the cameos we have Tanache. She comes out and as she's part of this movie's dance battle, which isn't, isn't bad by the way. Yeah. It's a different kind of dance battle, but I, you know, it's, it's, it's not as, as interesting as the original films, but it, it's still here and it's fairly well done. And I guess the thing that I found the most interesting about it is that she offers what Venus just from that one dance battle, like an opportunity to be a backup dancer. Yeah. Like we just kind of rush like a storyline for Venus, like through as quick as possible. Like, I think that's a real lame aspect of it. Like that doesn't really work at all. She's like, I'm going to give up my career to be a dancer. Like it was kind of, it was kind of rushed, huh? I thought the, the girlfriend of Kevin was yeah. lame. Yeah. 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 I thought she, the first of all, she's like against the whole thing because mm. it's at LeBron's house. Yeah. And then she all of a sudden's fine with it. It's like, pick, pick which one you are and stick with it. Oh, yeah. That was a definite issue in the movie. Yeah. So I thought she was pretty lame as a character. I didn't like her at all. So we do get the kid and play dance tribute where the... They do. Yeah, they touch heels. Yeah, they touch heels. How do you feel about House Party being like a movie in this universe of the reboot? Because they're watching House Party at one point. Yeah. And they openly reference the storyline of the second movie. Very meta of them. Yeah, it's it's kind of a strange thing. I don't, it doesn't really add to much. It doesn't lead to a joke or anything. It's just kind of there. I thought it was hard to grasp the era of this movie. What do you mean? With some of the older references. Yeah, there was a moment earlier where, like, there's a big reaction when they're playing, like, a 90s rap song. Yeah. And I thought, I can't remember the song. I don't know if you remember it offhand, but I remember thinking to myself, like, why the hell would he get excited about that? That like, guy's like... Like 29, 28, you're supposed to be mid 20s in this movie, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what the hell would he care about a song from the 90s for? And like, everybody in the party reacts. It's not a song from the first movie. So it's just an older song. It's just a strange moment, kind of another odd one in this film. And not in the good way, like the the, the end of the movie with the Illuminati. Yeah. Yeah. So do we want to go ahead and talk about Kid Cudi's whole sequence? Yeah. So we can introduce the Kid Cudi early in the movie, and he wants to give LeBron something. And uh, Damon keeps trying to like a song and stuff like that. It's a poem. And I, I love that. And it is indeed a poem. It is his only true gift to LeBron that he does want to impart with him. But Kid Cudi really drives the finale of the film because like the story's a bit of a mess. And so we get the bullies, they break into the party and they find LeBron James trophy room where the, the hologram LeBron was and they steal the Cleveland ring mm-hmm. and they're screwed. Except for the fact that Kid Cudi is a member of the Illuminati and they have copies made of every ring of every championship ever. Convenient. So they, yes, they, they do happen to have one. But it's the Illuminati, so it's fine, right? Like, if you invent a portal to do something, I'll be like, well, I guess I can go wherever you want, right? So it, it's kind of the same difference. It's a, a magical thing, but I will allow it because the scene is just like, it does feel like from a different movie a little bit, but I mean, it's just off the wall wild. Right. Mm-hmm. They head down there. They try to sneak through and it ends up with Damon and Kevin having to do a battle for the death. Right. Yeah. And, and it is interrupted by Kid Cudi coming and killing all of the guards. Right. Yeah. And, and he is eventually stabbed, which is of no concern to him because he knows they'll bring him back. Yeah. He's on his, what do you say? He's on, he's on his ninth Kid Cudi. Or? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. This scene is really out of nowhere. It's completely insane. And I loved every minute of it. I did too. I mean, it really made me laugh. I can't stress to you how much I had hard belly laughs during this whole sequence. 
like I said, didn't expect it. Pleasant surprise. It comes out of nowhere. Yeah, it, it really does. And it comes in and, and leaves just as quickly. Yeah. Because after that, we get like the depressing like wrap up because Damone has to go to jail because he challenges LeBron James, which is, how do I put it? I think there's a lot of funny ways to present a regular person playing against LeBron James, and they didn't pick any of those. Yeah. <laughs> because what they did was he gets to make one three-pointer and get to talk a little shit, and then LeBron just scores, you know, 11 points easily. That's it. Yeah. You know, they, they, I was surprised there wasn't another way to mine some comedy out of that. And, I mean, LeBron isn't, isn't bad when he shows. I know LeBron got ripped for this, but he's fine. I, like I said, I was just a, a little surprised at wasted potential. There's a lot of moments like that, a waste of potential, but that's the biggest one that sticks out to me. Why did, a regular person playing LeBron James could be really funny. Why did he get ripped for it? Well, I, I think people just didn't appreciate his performance at all, and they thought he was really wooden and stiff and should, shouldn't try acting. He was. I mean, yeah, I mean, he is wooden, but I don't think he's the most wooden person in the movie. No, but he was. I, I, I didn't think he was that bad. In the pantheon of actors on, I mean, of athletes on screen, I didn't think he was that bad. He's been better. Yeah, he was better in Trainwreck. Yeah. He, was, he wasn't better in, in Space Jam. No. But Michael Jordan sucks in Space Jam, too. Yeah. Just nobody cares because he's Michael Jordan. And that, and we love the movie because it came out when we were kids. The same way, well, actually, no, no one's going to love this new Space Jam because no one's going to remember it. No. It bombed. I don't even think you can get it on HBO Max. It's one of those movies. It did so poorly, they just disavowed knowledge of it. So, yeah, that's pretty much the end of the movie. But what's nice is, is when he gets out, when Damone gets out of, of jail, Maya's there waiting for yeah, him. Yeah, she's still waiting for him. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Kevin gets a, a really tacked-on happy ending. His beats, everybody loves him, even though he had no confidence in him throughout the whole movie. He gets to play him one time. And, oh, I, f- I forget what cameo person is interested in him. But it doesn't matter. That that's it, it wrapped up. He basically becomes a star because of that. It's not Yeah, there was some cameos. There was Odell Beckham who had a funny joke. Oh my god, Odell Beckham shows up in a in a Looney Tunes moment. <laughs> he tra- he, there's a Asian man who's trying to be like, No, 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 I have to keep you safe no matter what. I can't let you get injured. And then they've established that there's a hole in the floor. But the hole is probably like what, four inches across? Yeah. The whole movie. And Odell Beckham steps in the hole trying to get in on one of the big dance numbers, and he falls through it like someone cut a hole through the ice in like an old school Looney Tune. Mm-hmm. And like that's the scene. <laughs> and it's 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 wacky. It's not funny. It's just it feels like someone shot it out of a different era. Yeah, or a different movie. Yeah, it just it doesn't fit at all. But it's there. So you have that moment. The problem was better than Odell. Then you have uh, Tristan Thompson. I, I did like that joke. Mark Cuban. Because they were looking for a ring, and so Tristan Thompson would be the only person. That, it's a good joke. Like, oh, damn it, another person who also won a championship that year. And I'm sure there were more cameos. Cuban was whatever. But those are the ones that I noted. Yeah. But there was like a whole scene. Too much acting, not enough GM work. <sighs> that overrated Luka Doncic. Go <laughs> fuck yourself. <laughs> Woo! Ah, sleeping on the couch tonight. Are you done? I am done. Very well. Mm. N- not a real recommend mm. on the movie. I think if you're a house party completionist, sure, check it out. I think if you want an update to the story, you, you can see how it fares for you. But, uh, you know, I-, I feel like I'm being generous to it a little bit. The original's better. And I still can't say, like, check this out. Yeah. You want to watch the original film. Don't necessarily worry about this remake. Yeah, because I didn't care for the music in this movie. It's acceptable at best. Yeah. And that's about it, really. Nothing special. All right, so for reviews, House Party 1990, 6.5 on IMDb, 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. For House Party 2023, 28% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 4.4 out of 10 on IMDb. Okay, so here's the one-star reviews. Another older movie I shouldn't have kept in the memory banks. It was so much better there. Now that I have watched it again, I can't believe how whack it was. Kid and Play cannot act, and the plot was lousy. Furthermore, it wasn't a good showcase of the talents of Robin Harris, John Witherspoon, and Martin Lawrence. The only thing good about the movie was the rap battle between Kid and Play. They weren't the best lyricists, but they did a good job in the, in the battle scene. 1990 was the beginning of a golden era of hip-hop. See, this guy agrees yeah, with me. Yeah, yeah. It's because it was. Yeah, no, and it's you, not wrong. And you could see and hear the conversion. Scratching, beatboxing, gold chains were a thing of the past. Oh, yeah. The beats, the chords, and the lyrics were starting to get more sophisticated. The clothes they were wearing in the movie, though, those were buff ugly. Whatever that is, back then. 
Those outfits weren't indicative of the 90s, really, except for maybe the clothes worn by Tisha Campbell and A.J. Johnson. Ken and Play were hot for a minute, and then and they cashed in on their short-lived success. They had more upbeat party time brand of hip-hop, which caught on. Kid and Play, like most artists in the music industry, were better at music than they were at movies. I mean, there's a couple of fair points there. You know, like I said, if you can't appreciate the charm, you're not going to be able to appreciate this movie. So, you know, the acting isn't great. You know, he, he talked about all the negatives and the positives never worked for him. Yeah. That gives you a one star movie. And then here's another one star for the new movie. The original had heart and more decent laughs in some really funny situations. Kid and Play were perfect and that movie was just perfect with its supporting cast. Many of those cast members went on to the Friday franchise and relied on humor, not stupidity. The music was great and that the movie director went to direct Eddie Murphy's Boomerang. No clue why they messed with an already perfect lowbrow comedy that worked. I guess LeBron figured it, if he puts his name on something, it sells. Well, that might work if he, what he's doing is any good. First, he screwed up Space Jam and now House Party. I gotta quit giving his entertainment a chance when it simply sucks. <laughs> this time around, the director is known for music videos and is out of his league making mu- movies. This is basically one long mu- music video that relies on its two leads, who I guess are real-life rappers. They break into LeBron James' home and decide to party by inviting everyone. Yep, a multi-millionaire's home in a well-to-do neighborhood gets invaded by folks we're supposed to believe will have no issue blending into a wealthy community. Um, yeah. Anyhow, there were a few chuckles and some decent music, but not enough to carry 100 minutes. Instead, it's like watching a Pimp My Ride or MTV Cribs episode. Even the music just isn't original enough to capture what the 1990 movie had. I'm all for the remake, but it's got, got to be better than the original. Save your money with this one. Well, he did not like that at all. No, he did not. I, you know, he did bring up something that I thought was interesting. That's about Cal Medic. That's the guy who directed this movie. He's a music video director, like he said. He has directed some nice videos. I thought this movie really lacked any kind of style. Yeah. When you think about movies directed by music video directors, I'm sure there's some flashing in your head right now. I mean, granted, you can't think of like Alien 3 and think Fincher. Not everyone's like that. But even something like Joseph Kahn, he did a motorcycle movie that's escaping that's escaping me right now. I can't remember the name of it. But that movie has like a real over-the-top kind of style. And this movie's just there, stylistically. Mm-hmm. It's just not really impressively directed. It's just something else I kind of wanted to mention about it. He's going to do the remake that we'll have to cover eventually of uh, White Men Can't Jump. That's coming up. I, I think he's probably shooting it right now. So that's something that we'll have to get pretty familiar with this guy. So I just want to mention that. like He is a music video director, but I really never felt that throughout this movie. Yeah, it's just a good point by that guy. Mm-hmm. Hard to believe as it may be, but in 1990, Roger Ebert took the time to review House Party because he reviewed everything that came out that was worthwhile. And as we've talked about, House Party is more than worthwhile. Meredith, what do you think he gave it? Do you think he liked it? No, I don't think he liked it. He gave House Party three stars. Wow. Yeah, he did. He liked House Party. Roger Ebert says, House Party is, first of all, a musical, and best approached in that spirit. To call it a teenage movie would confuse the characters with the subject. Yes, it's about a crowd of black teenagers who go to the same school and hang out together. And it's about their loves and rivalries and a party that one of the kids is having at his house. But the plot is an excuse to hang a musical on, and the movie is wall-to-wall with exuberant song and dance. Original Hollywood movies have fallen on hard times. The golden age is long gone. And now we get to the retreads of Broadway shows or rock concert films. Only occasionally in films like Saturday Night Fever, Dirty Dancing, or even The Little Mermaid, do we get a film where the dramatic developments coexist with original and creative soundtrack music. In the case of House Party, the musical is a canvas used by the director, Reginald Hudlin, to show us black teenagers with a freshness and originality that's rare in modern movies. We hardly ever see black teenagers at all in films, And when we do, they're painted in images that are either negative or threatening, or impossibly clean-cut. His teenagers are neither. They're normal, average kids with a universal desire to go to a party and dance. The movie's hero is Kid, Christopher Reed, a bright goofball with a haircut that makes Eraserhead look like a Marine. He lives with his father, Robin Harris, a gruff but lovable disciplinarian who doesn't seem unreasonable, but does believe a kid should do his homework before partying at night. And when Kid gets in trouble, he should be grounded. 
Kid doesn't want to be grounded, of course. Like all teenagers, he believes that life literally exists one day at a time, and that an opportunity missed today, especially an opportunity to meet the girlfriend of his dreams, is missed forevermore. He sneaks out of the home, leading to a long night of mild slapstick, as he's chased by his father, the police, and by three tough athletes from his school, who he has unwisely offended. The chase is served to punctuate the music and the dancing. A lot of energy in this movie comes from the natural, unaffected performance of Reed as the teenager who will do anything to get to that dance. He has an engaging, off-center rhythm that suggests he plans to think his way through life instead of making a frontal assault. In his encounters with the jocks from his high school, he tries to talk his way out of tight spots. His seduction technique with girls is almost entirely verbal. He'll convince them that they like him. To their credit, the girls, Sydney, Tisha Campbell, and Shireen, A.J. Johnson, look at times like they almost believe him. In matters of romance, teenage boys can take themselves so dreadfully seriously that Kid must come off as a pleasant change of pace. House Party is a first feature for writer-director Reginald and producer Warrington Hudlin brothers from East St. Louis, and is based on a shorter film Reginald made while a student at Harvard. Like his older contemporary, Spike Lee, he is a black filmmaker who is concerned with his black characters on their own terms and doesn't feel the need felt by earlier generation of directors to relate his characters and plots to white society. His characters don't represent anything but themselves. And there are moments of refreshing honesty here, as when two teenage boys discuss the disadvantages of dating a girl from a project, one problem, Her relatives always seem to be hanging around watching TV. There is a certain deadening way in which some critics have taken to evaluating recent films about blacks, in which recent points are given for positive imagery enforcement, useful themes, and the promotion of middle-class values. To describe House Party in those terms would be unfair and would miss the whole point of the movie's energy and exuberance. It was refreshing for a change to see a story about young blacks that didn't revolve around societal problems, thriller elements, drugs, or any other form of seriousness. House Party is a silly, high-spirited, and not particularly significant, and that is just as it should be. Eva really liked this movie. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. I agree with Eva. Maybe not as strongly as Eber does, but I I certainly agree. Mary, do you have any other final thoughts on the movies? No. No? Well, you know, if, if, you know, I was pleasantly surprised. Mm-hmm. That's the way I'll, I'll take a look at it. This I, I was kind of dreading having to do the other house party, especially after you know the reviews I read and even listening to Tudor's show. I was impressed a little bit by that movie that it wasn't just god-awful, god-awful garbage. Yeah. So I, I guess there is that. The, the little positive takeaway uh, this week. And if you think I'm crazy for taking positive away from a film that's universally reviled, you can uh, let me know that in the most 90s way possible. And that's to email us at grittyrebootcast at gmail.com. And that you can send us anything you like and, you know, send us a question, a recommendation for a movie, whatever you want. And, you know, we'll read it on air. Then, of course, you can also get a hold of us, uh, Gritty Reboot at TikTok and at Instagram. Uh, that's the easiest and quickest way to get a hold of us. You know, we, we post there, you know, mostly daily, sometimes not as much. But, you know, we're always pretty active there. So you can you can always find a way to get a hold of us and talk to us about anything you, know, you want to about the show. Give us feedback or whatever. You know, rate us five stars, please. I don't yeah, know. like, subscribe, all that jazz. Yeah. Please do that because it helps our show. Yeah, yeah. We're just we're just two people out here just trying to have a good time podcast. We hope you enjoy it. So it's all, you know, just wander over there. Give us five stars if you like it. If you think we suck and give us one star, please just unsubscribe. <laughs> 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 we, we can't afford that one star hit. We can't. All right. We appreciate you listening this far. Let's see you on the show. All right, guys. Have Bye. a good one. Bye.